is equivalent to the scalar Hilbert sum. Oh, no, no, no. Um, the, so here, I'll write it out. So um, the trace of, in, in, in this covariant notation that we've adopted here for relativity, the trace of a two by two matrix can be taken to be the contraction of indices with the metric tensor, um, having upper indices and these having lower indices. So um, if you consider the, if you know, an, a, you know, a toy example would be for the Cartesian metric or maybe, maybe the Minkowski metric in, in one dimension, um, if you have, uh, you know, minus this, the minus plus 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 convention here, um, writing out uh, this, you know that G mu nu um, has no off-diagonal components. Um, so uh, this equals zero if mu doesn't equal v. So the only possible values, and this is the scalar curvature, the only possible um, values for this um, sum right here, because remember, repeated indices implies a sum. There's a sum over mu and a sum over nu here. Um, this would be g11, r11, plus g22, r22. Um, and this equals uh, um, R11 plus R22. The reason this isn't negative one, or excuse me, sorry, should have written this. Because um, remember, uh, G mu nu, G mu nu has to equal the identity. And uh, the way that works out here is the inverse metric has to have this as a positive one. Um, but we, we see that we indeed get the trace the two by two case. Um, but uh, yeah, so the Einstein field equations, they're, they're, they're an equation on, they're a nonlinear um, uh, matrix of partial differential equations on the metric. So the metric um, is um, what you're solving for uh, when you solve the Einstein field equations. You want to figure out what G mu nu is, because this is, because, right. yeah. Yeah, so that's like what uh, defines space time. Right? Yes, exactly. The metric tells you how to measure distances and how distances transform, um, or how distances are preserved. Um, in this case, from reference frame to reference frame, um, or um, over space time. Right, and that uh, from the and that you, when you get to the geodesic, uh, that basically tells you most of the things you need to know about motion. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, the geodesics give you the equations of motion. Um, so, what was I doing here? Um, so, this being equal to t here, um, when you suspend, suspending um, any indices here just implies it's the trace. Uh, so, really, I could also write um, g here as well because there's only um, one component of. Uh, G that matters here, or that that's not trivial. Um, uh, I had written uh, G mu nu is supposed to equal um, that the metric um, is roughly flat plus higher order um, perturbations. Um, and I'm guessing that when we're talking about these like ideal fluids, that means they have uniform density. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then of course, since I'm since we were talking about a constant gravitational field here, um, the uniform density, uh, it would be higher orders of derivatives of um, uh, the field, the gravitational field itself. So. Um, so the trace of so this is the this is the trace of both sides of the field equations, but of course there's only one component of um, the uh, Ricci tensor and the energy momentum tensor here. And you know I, I kind of wrote something a little misleading. Um, if this only has um, four uh, 
components. Um, actually, no, no, no. It doesn't only have four components. It has. It only has four components in in a two dimensional case. Um, it can be a a four by four matrix, of course, because um, our indices run from zero to three, uh, including zero. The point was that it only has a single value. Um, so writing it like this, um, remember that the trace of the metric um, uh, for G being approximately um, the Minkowski metric is um, four. Because it's, you know, you have minus one plus one plus one plus one. Um, and so now plugging this in, we get r minus one half times four r, which equals um, uh, so this becomes uh, two, which equals negative r, equaling kappa t. Um, so from here, uh, noting that we can write a trace of any matrix like this, um, what we can do is uh, we know that this equation here coming from the single component um, stress energy tensor, uh, what's really going on is just like we made this approximation here for it being an ideally flat metric plus some higher order terms on the um, on the, the scalar gravitational field, um, we can do the, we can expand the stress tensor here um, in a similar way. So So what I can do is I can say um, Kappa G mu T nu. Now I've reintroduced um, components a little bit here. It's um, Kappa times um, the energy density plus higher order um, uh, negative plus higher order um, terms on the field. So this implies that um, negative r uh, equals negative kappa rho, truncating these terms, of course, which means that the scalar curvature is is roughly um, uh, kappa rho. Um, so for this single entry be, uh, being the energy density for for um, for dust and the um, energy momentum tensor here, the non-trivial solution. that we find here is um, R0,0 equals kappa T0,0, um, and then of course uh, plus one half G0,0 um, R. This came from adding over that term from the other side. Um, but this whole thing has to be equal to um, one half kappa rho. Um, because this is kappa rho and this is negative one g zero zero, so one minus one half is just one half. Um, so now let's compute the let's compute the Ricci tensor. Um, R uh lambda zero lambda zero um, to other orders of um, phi here um, or up to orders of uh, this gravitational field and see what we get um, so remember that the the uh, uh, let's see if I can do this from memory. The Riemann curvature tensor, um, uh, I believe, rho sigma mu mu, um, it was proportional 
to um, it's proportional to oh well it's actually it's equal to this uh, commutator of the of covariant derivatives um, you take two derivatives and then you subtract off the both derivatives in the other order. If it's non-zero, it means you have some curvature in your on the manifold that your um, uh, your coordinates um, live on. Um, but when you contract uh, these two indices here, when you multiply by um, g uh, mu rho to get um, the Riemann curvature tensor, or excuse me, the Ricci um, tensor, because what happens is Ricci tensor is simply um, it's defined as contracting the first and third indices here. Um, that long formula on the covariant derivatives gets contracted, because remember, there's a bunch of Christoffel symbols within there. So um, recall Christoffel symbols um, we have gamma mu nu rho equals one half g mu sigma partial um, rho g um, sigma v Plus, um, no, what's going on here? Uh, I should write it like this. So, so that's the Christoffel symbol um, uh, for R um, lambda zero, lambda zero equaling R. Zero zero. Um, not equaling to zero, uh, and the other and the other components being zero, of course. There's only one case where the Christoffel symbol doesn't equal zero. It's um, it's for Zero indices, uh, zero entries in these bottom um, uh, elements here, and only spatial components in the top here. So uh, it turns out, and you can go through the derivation, it turns out that this is equal to the Kronecker delta symbol um, uh, and the gradient of phi. Um, uh, mm. I should have written that the one case is um, for spatial derivatives only. Um, so you can you can have gamma i zero zero, and then you can also have gamma zero i zero, which equals this because it's symmetric in these bottom indices here. Um, uh, this just equals partial i phi. Uh, but remember, partial i phi, the spatial components of the four gradient, it's the it's it's um it's just the gradient, and that's kind of what we want. We want to we want to be able to pull out these um these gradient components here, and and that also makes sense too, if, if considering that we're trying to look at what this tensor is up to um, higher order terms on the gravitational field. Um, so so these are the only non-zero Christoffel symbols up to um, first order derivatives on um, the gravitational field, uh, which is what we want. So, so now, um, let's see here. And we suspended this. Uh, we, tr we truncated off these higher order terms on on phi here, because um, we said that the 
the metric is essentially flat for this, um, this collection of uh, dust particles that we're dealing with. And what we want to do is um, show that even with sources in this simple case here that we can get um, Newton's, shoot, Newton's second law here of gravity. I did that, but so Ooh. we said that we have um, this going on. Um, so I believe um, in full uh, the Christoffel symbols give. Um, the Ricci tensor in terms of the Christoffel symbols are um, its derivatives on the these Christo uh, it's, it's four gradients on these Christoffel symbols because rem remember it comes from the uh, Riemann curvature tensor which um, has uh, four gradient or um, excuse me um, covariant derivatives in it and the covariant derivative is defined in terms of this plus um, another uh, connection term. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what this is supposed to be. I believe um, there's this lambda here, and then there's a nu and another lambda. And then we subtract off um, uh, partial derivative with respect to lambda of Christoffel symbol and... There's another. That's pretty similar to the definition of the soft symbol. Um, and then there's plus um, these two other terms. I'd have to look up to find them, make sure I have the indices correct. But um, I believe you're able to choose a reference frame such that you can always truncate these terms here. And um, what happens now is uh, we showed that from from before. The uh, Ricci tensor is um, supposed to be one half kappa rho um, up to these higher order terms on phi um, and uh, we saw that um, the only upper higher order terms are these gradients and what we want is this equaling 4 pi g uh, rho. So the other side over here was um, kappa t mu nu um, which is this guy right here, but uh, if we want conservation now, um, what we have to do, because remember we said, uh, um, there's the equation here. Um, this one. Uh, the only non-trivial conserved um, curvature tensor um, that we could come up with was this one, which equals zero, um, which also equals covariant derivative of uh, energy momentum tensor. So if we subtract this guy over again, and we take the, um, excuse me, the uh, covariant derivative of both, uh, covariant derivative of both sides, what'll happen is um, uh, so. Um, Ah, okay, I remember now. So we showed that G mu nu reduces to R mu nu, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, these approximations, G mu nu, um, plus this higher order term here. But we also said that um, 
uh, the expansion of the trace of this uh, has to be um, uh, the energy density plus um, this higher order term. And then uh, for the Christoffel symbol uh, being um, this gradient of, uh, of phi, um, and it also being the only um, first order derivative term that uh, is non-trivial for um, for the the Ricci scalar being like being only one component. Um, when you go through the calculation um, of the Ricci scalar, um, it'll be um, it'll become this uh, uh, gradient of the uh, Christoffel symbol which then becomes um, uh, something like this, which is in fact the um, Laplacian of phi. And then when we plug everything back in, what we find is um, Laplacian of phi, which is R zero zero being equal to this constant times T zero zero um, plus uh, one half G zero zero, um, the Ricci scalar. Um, phi squared is equal to kappa rho um, minus one half kappa rho, and we derive this um, down there, and it's simply equal to um, one half kappa rho. And um, if you remember, I didn't derive it here, but if you remember that kappa is equal to eight pi g, what happens when you substitute this in here is um, phi squared, or the uh, excuse me, the plus unit of phi is equal to four pi g rho, and this is exactly what Newton's law is. So indeed, the Einstein field equations um, do hold. Uh, and this is actually one, one way you could derive it. You could say that you know that the, um, the field equations have to be proportional, or the, the um, Einstein tensor has to be proportional to the energy momentum tensor up to some constant. And you could say, um, well, I also know that this has to certainly reproduce the, um, the easy cases of gravity, Newton's, sec uh, Newton's second law. Um, so let's go through this, uh, this derivation here, make these approximations for um, a weak field, and say, what does this constant kappa have to be such that we do get Newton's second law? And it does happen to be 8 pi g. So that's cool. So we can basically derive it without seeing how Einstein equations Exactly. That's exactly correct. Um, I'll just organize my notes here a little bit. Um, now what I'm going to do well, is essentially like a point map. So like yeah, um It's not necessarily a point mass. Um there is like you can you can show how the Schwarzschild the, the reason it predu uh, predicts black holes is because you have this um event horizon um that's proportional to um mass times Newton's um constant of gravity and then you also get a singularity um that implies that at the center of this spherically symmetric potential, um, be, which is you know supposed to be a black hole, that you have an infinite, um, an infinite uh, source. You get this um, this this weird discontinuity. Uh, but um, yeah, so now what I planned to, to go to was the um, the Einstein Hilbert um, action to show you like the most rigorous way in which you can derive the Einstein field equations. Um, so, check the time. So, um, everything we've done so far, uh, we haven't, um, we haven't, uh, essentially everything that uh, I've showed you so far has kind of been, um, you know, let's choose this approximation in this ideal system and force it to reproduce Newton's law. Um, but there has to be a way, if, new, if, if Einstein's equations truly are um, the most um, correct uh, classical um, description of gravity, there has to be a way to, from, to, to obtain his equations from a uh, stationary action principle. You have to be able to uh, use Einstein's equations in analytical mechanics. Um, and the way you do that is you find um, the, the action that corresponds to it um, but it's not even that you're finding the action, it's that you're just defining 
how a functional integral would look like for um, curved space. Uh, and from there, when you take its variation, you'll find that Einstein's equations fall out, um, which is very, very um, foundational because uh, it starts, it's, it's kind of like students' first exposure to um, uh, field theory without having to worry about like um, quantum mechanics and stuff like that, but also um, uh, the way you include interactions, which is how we'll get to point source terms, is you'll sum um, the actions that correspond to different things. So there'll be a curvature action, which will give Einstein's equations in a vacuum, and then there'll be a, a matter action. Um, so, and if I have time, I'll talk about uh, the Klein-Gordon equation in, in curved space-time, if I can. Um, but anyhow, um, so... Our goal here is to write down an action whose minimization yields um, the Einstein field equations. Um, so, uh, Remember um, something we had talked about at, uh, at one point before we went to um, the Lorentz invariant uh, Lagrangian formalism of special relativity that um, for a single degree of freedom, um, your action functional looks like this. where L is some Lagrangian defined as um, kinetic energy minus potential energy. Um, you're e extremizing this integral over time. It's, it's, a, it's really like a, like a path integral in um, QT space. Uh, and your functional, which is a function of a function, um, is only a function of your Qs and their first time derivative. Um, but for field theory, we now have to worry about um, something that's a function of both space and time, um, meaning that there's that this this metric has a um, a non-trivial value, uh, or rather just a value um, at every point in space and time. Um, so, what this implies for us is it's probably best to formulate our action um, functional as a, as a function of the metric tensor, which is a function of coordinates, which are parameterized by this affine parameter lambda, and the um, first derivative of the metric tensor. Um, so this, this four gradient right here. Um, so uh, what this implies is that this is going to be equal to this integral over um, four space, um, or, or uh, sorry, um, it's an integral over space time. So here, um, d four x is equal to um, uh, so it's it's d t d r. Um, so it's an integral over time and an integral over um, volume. Because uh, in field theory, what happens is um, what you want to look at are Lagrangian densities. So um, here, the, the single degree of freedom was for a Lagrangian that um, we're extremizing over time. But now what we want to do is we want to look at Lagrangians over all of space, which will be a function of what's called curly L, which, which it's, it's, it turns out that um, most um, uh, physicists, when they do this, they they start calling this just the Lagrangian instead of Lagrangian density, but it'll be a function of um, things that are uh, that have a point in, in, in space and time. So these are fields right here. Um, so uh, the Lagrangian that in question now will be something that's um, a function of the metric and uh, first derivatives of the metric. Um, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, so some principles to impose 
um, we need coordinate invariance. That's part of the whole shebang of relativity um, and its, its reasoning behind its tensorial um, formulation. Yeah, that's all the four vector stuff. Yeah. Um, but what this, what this implies is that we, uh, when we integrate over space-time, um, space-time is now allowed to be curved. Um, if you think about it, um, in our four-vector um, formulation, uh, um, in flat space-time, the curvature, um, the scalar curvature is just one because there's no curvature. Um, but what you do when you have curved space is you define um, an integration measure. Uh, so what this is is um, since the metric is corresponding to um, uh, how you preserve distances and how, how their lengths change when as space curves, um, what you do is uh, you include this term in your um, differential because as you integrate, um, you know, areas under curves, volumes, and so on and so forth, um, they're going to change from, at different um, uh, patches of space-time, if that makes sense. So um, in the presence of uh, um, mass, for example, um, or matter, um, space-time is curved, so distances are curvilinear and look different as, than if they were, um, uh, if it was just flat space-time. Uh, so there's a more um, in-depth way to, to, to derive um, this term right here, but um, really it's, it's just a statement on uh, keeping your integration um, uh, proper um, overall space and time. So Isn't Lagrangian density uh, just like the kinetic energy minus potential energy uh, that uh, I, al I always hear about, or is it something different? Um, so the, yeah, that's a good question. I should have um, probably have uh, written it out. We use curly L's and curly and, and, and like script um, uh, variables when we when we describe it. But it's it's energy. It's kinetic energy density minus potential energy density. So it's it's um, it's kinetic energy minus potential energy per um, unit volume. So maybe per uh, you know, right? Like, um, yeah, it gets confusing. X cubed, because um, it's supposed to be. Um, remember, it's supposed to be uh, um, the regular Lagrangian per volume, um, because remember we define the regular Lagrangian as this integral over volume um, of the curly of the of the Lagrangian density. But um, if it's if we if you know if there's a constant volume, um, or if this is constant over all space, it would just be volume. Um, and uh, you could say it's curly L is just L over V. Um, of course, that's not what happens um, at all. But because uh, uh, this is this is this is a function of um, the thing that is that has a, uh, a value at every point in space time, and uh, it's, it's you know the Lagrangian near a black hole, the energy ha distribution has to be different than for flat space, of course. Um, but uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Um, the way uh, we we do things in classical mechanics is it's always good to only have uh, zero first and second order derivatives of the object that your action is a functional of, whether it's degrees of freedom, um, or in this case fields. Um, so we we should expect our variation to give us something. <clears throat> Excuse me. That isn't um, crazy and looks and looks similar to. Uh... <clears throat> yeah, sorry. Um, my allergies are always really bad around this time, and it makes me Same cough here. a lot. Same here. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, what this implies is um, for. Yielding um, zeroth, first and second order derivatives of um, g mu nu. This implies that the Lagrangian density 
should be proportional to the um, scalar curvature. Excuse me. And the reason being is because um, the uh, the scalar curvature um, comes from so so this is really c um, g mu nu r mu nu um, so the Ricci uh, tensor is in there somewhere and the Ricci tensor is formulated in terms of um, derivatives of the uh, um, the metric. Um, so what's going to happen is we're going to start taking functional derivatives of things here. And what we want to have happen is when we expand things that we don't have a higher order derivative um, than, uh, or, or, or a derivative of order th uh, higher than two um, when we extremize this action. Because um, what would happen is if you had um, just the Ricci tensor, um, what would happen is uh, the variation would... Um, it would go on to, uh, it would go on to the. Well, first off, I don't think it would give the um, the uh, the field equations in a vacuum because I'm I'm going to show you in a minute. But the variation of the Ricci tensor is actually a boundary term, so it'll just go away. But um, it it this is we choose this um, uh, this to start off with, or at least to try to see if it works um, because we want to have this satisfied. So. Um, we define the Einstein-Hilbert action, or sometimes it's just called the Hilbert action. Um, it's equal to uh, this integral over space-time over, um, of course, with our, our integration metric here, uh, over the scalar curvature up to a constant, um, where our Lagrangian is, is proportional to um, the Ricci scalar. So um, for extremization, uh, basically applying the principle of least action. We have a few things going on. So we have this constant, it'll factor out. We never, um, the, integra the integration um, differential here obviously stays the same. And we have variation of the determinant of G um, I'm not sure if I said that yet. The, the square root over, over negative g um, is just the the um, it's just the uh, determinant of it. G um, without any indices is the trace, and um, you, you get a you get a negative sign factor out. So we have this negative here. So really, negative g is positive. Negative trace of of our metric tensor having that relative minus sign on the diagonals here is positive, and the square root gives us the determinant. Um, so uh, we're going to be taking the variation of the determinant of g, g mu nu, r mu nu, um, where this is the scalar um, curvature. So when we take um, when we take the variation of things, um, what's happening always is uh, um, the variation of some quantity. Uh, or no, when you take the variation of something, you're, what you're saying is you're you're taking the quantity quantity of interest. Maybe the things that your your um, action, for example, um, your action is a functional of, which in this case is g, and you're shifting it by a tiny little um, perturbation. So if you remember from um, uh, regular um, classical mechanics, analytical mechanics, your degrees of freedom over time, um, uh, your action extremizes is extremized over two points, which is the trajectory of um, a system. Um, and uh, it's this path integral, and uh, you f you want to find the path that minimizes um, the action, which which would look something like this, depending on the system. But also, um, when you take the variation, what you're doing is you're saying, let's think about what would happen if we disturbed this path a little bit. How do we make sure that um, even when we take its variation, that we get the right equations of motion? Um, so in this case, um, since the action is a functional of g. And, and g dot here, g dot is corresponding to the four gradient of g. Um, what we're really looking at is um, perturbing the metric here, um, and, and then also since this is a form of um, 
Uh, it's very closely related to Taylor expansions. In fact, it looks almost exactly like it. Um, we apply the product rule here. Um, so this is going to be equal to this constant. And the variable here again is t mu. Uh, mu. Yes, exactly. So we're going to have the variation of the determinant of g, g mu nu, r mu nu, plus the determinant of g times the variation of the inverse metric, r mu nu, plus um, uh, the, 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 the determinant of g times the inverse metric times the variation of the Ricci um, scalar. So now the tricky part is um, how do we do that? How do we tailor expand all of these things and and get a um, get equations of motion to pop out? Um, so we put it into the computer and write it. Full way of doing it, <laughs> um, but. Uh, the way we make sure that our computers are correct is, uh, um, in this case, um, remember, uh, recall this property of the metric. Um, this is equal to uh, oh, no. this Kronecker Not delta. Um, oh wait, no, wrong symbol. Yeah, this um, is the Kronecker delta symbol, yeah. and, and this this is for the yeah. this is for the Cartesian um, basis, of course. Um, the Kronecker delta is kind of similar, right? Um, yes. th this is the Kronecker delta. Yeah. Or did you mean the Levi Civita symbol? Yeah, the Levi Civita symbol is kind of similar. Um, uh, sort of. Um, it corresponds to. Uh, um, so uh, I would I would say that a way to think about it is the Levi Civita symbol allows you to look at um, the permutations of things um, in covariant in a covariant way using indices and stuff like that. Um, permutation of things is also closely related to the curls or the cross products of things. Um, and the Kronecker delta is related to just the regular vector dot product um, and how you multiply things um, and inner products. So um, so we know that this is going to be 1 or 0. Um, I, I guess I should have put in plus or minus because this can technically be – actually, no, no, not plus or minus because um, – if you have the negative, if you have the the first in this, um, entry times the first en uh, entry, it's it's positive one. Um, but um, under g mu nu being sent to g mu nu, this variation in g mu nu, this implies that g mu nu plus a variation in g mu nu times the quantity of g v sigma, plus the variation of g v sigma. It has to still be equal to this. So it shouldn't matter if we perturb this a little bit um, if we want to get the correct uh, relations. So um, if you carry this out and you, um, and you keep only first order terms, because that's part of how you take the variation of things, what will happen is you'll have the variation of g mu lambda times g lambda sigma plus g mu lambda variation of g lambda sigma, well, this has to be equal to zero. Um, so let's put this back here. Negative g lambda alpha variation of g alpha beta, g beta sigma. So I went a little fast here, but all I did was I added over a term and um, multiplied through by an inverse and just relabeled some dummy indices. Um, so this is this is um, this is like the first thing we want to get because we have um, three terms going on here. So really, I, I could have written this as um, I could have written the uh, um, the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action as um, the variation of like maybe S1 plus the variation of uh, S2 plus the variation of S3, where this corresponds to this guy, this corresponds to this guy, and this corresponds to this guy. Um, 
because it's a uh, it's a product of three things. So you get a sum of three things where you um, for each term you go through uh, this this variation operator. Um, so we got we uh, you know using that notation that I just wrote we got we got s one or the variation of s one. Now we want to get the variation of s two. Um, so Let's figure out how to take the variation of the determinant of g. This guy is a little easier. So for this, under g mu nu, mu nu, uh, variation of g mu nu, um, uh, recall that. Um, from linear algebra, the, ter the determinant of some matrix M um, can be is equal to the exponential of the trace of the natural log of um, that same matrix. Uh, the trace is the sum of its diagonal oh. components. Um, so um, the variation of the trace of G is going to be equal to G times the very or okay, so I can write this as. Um, Wait, so is the log of a matrix just like the inverse of the exponential of a matrix? Yeah, so you know how. Um, like e to the m, uh, e to the matrix is like the expansion to mm -hmm. e to the x. Yeah. Uh, so log is just like defined by e to the log of a matrix is equal to that matrix, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Um, right. So, uh, so if G is the trace, the variation of G is the variation of the trace, which means this should be equal to. Um, so this is the variation of the trace of the log g mu nu um, ah, let me underwrite this differently so so let me just be let me just make sure I'm being clear about what I'm doing here. So the square root of negative g is equal to the square root of negative the determinant of g. And I'm not sure if I said that incorrectly earlier. Um, we know that the determinant of g is always negative because of the relative minus sign between the um, di uh, of the first diagonal components and the, and the spatial ones. And this square root allows us to um, have this normalization factor in our integration measure. So that's why it's included. Um, but uh, um, we say that uh, little um, uh, lowercase g without any indices is equal to the determinant of g mu nu. So the determinant, or the, or the variation of um, the determinant of g uh, it, this is equal to um, the variation of the exponential of the trace of g, because of um, this relation right here, um, and applying um, <coughs> excuse me, applying um, your, uh, if you if you Taylor expand this, what you find is um, this is uh, so you can take out a g. Um, and that's the trace of the metric, right? This is the determinant of the metric. Oh. Um, and you have this variation of the trace of the log. Um, make sure I'm doing this right. Anyways, um, back, to, back to this. Um, for, for G being the determinant of the metric, and the determinant of a matrix, because remember, G is, takes a matrix form here. It's the exponential of the trace of a log. So what, I, what, I'm, what I'm really doing here is um, 
I'm taking the variation of the negative exponential uh, to the one half power of the trace of the log of g mu nu. Um, and the variation, uh, Taylor expands things to first order. Um, so really, it's it's e to the negative one half trace log g mu nu times the variation of um, negative one half trace log g mu nu. And uh, from here, um, the oh, so it's like the chamber. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now what we want to do is uh, we want to look at um, how we can take the variation of this. So um, if you remember, uh, you know, the derivative of the natural log. Oh, that's one over x, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so uh, the variation of the log of g new would simply be um, it would be g inverse mu nu because remember this is a matrix which would be g upper mu nu g mu nu um, and uh, we can also formulate this in a um, in a little differently in a little different notation here so we're taking the square root of um, something so this variation could be we can define it as maybe uh, one half um, negative g to the one half minus one, which would be negative one half um, variation of negative g, and this is just um, uh, excuse me one over two negative g, um, and uh, let's see here the Variation of reg of uh, regular G here comes from uh, um, that this is the variation of square root of the determinant, and maybe let's talk about what the variation of G is. which comes from this. Um, so uh, variation um, regular G uh, so for G being a determinant it was, it was this variation of this exponential it's approximately um, uh, the trace of the log G mu nu um, variation uh, plus um, higher order terms, um, and then the variation of that from here uh, times ti uh, times g, I believe. Um, this would definitely be something to, to, to double check me on. Um, this there this this isn't hard to find online. I know that there's definitely plenty of um, variations of this, but uh, um, now what we can do is we can say um, the so we have g times this variation of the trace of the log and the log um, is simply uh, um, you know its variation would be uh, variation of g mu nu um, times g inverse um, you know it's that, it's that formula right there and um, what we get is so putting that here we get g g mu nu uh, And then um, we can we can take this guy, 
put it together. Oh, and this should this, this can become a positive g, and it'll it'll be one half. Um, or no, you can't. Can you take that out? Can we do the negative constant? Like, what if they? Yeah, you're I, you're negative. correct. You're correct. I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. The determinant is probably negative anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay, all right, so I think this is correct. So from here, um, uh, one minus one half is just, um, so we have this negative from, from here. Um, square root negative g, g mu nu, variation of g mu nu. Um, so that's the second component. And now for the final component, um, S3 here, we have to look at the variation of the Ricci tensor, but um, remember it's defined in terms of um, covariant derivatives. So what you have to look at, and Christoffel symbols, so derivatives of the Christoffel symbols is really what is, what's going on here. So um, under g mu nu being sent to g mu nu plus um, some variation in g mu nu, what's really happening is the Christoffel symbol um, is being varied. So it, this, this becomes an extremely um, intensive computation. But um, uh, what, what we want to look at is the variation of the difference between two connections. So um, maybe uh, the covariant derivative of the variation of, let's do rho sigma mu here. Uh, so this would be partial lambda. Um, so I'll just write it out here. So the so just the definition of the covariant derivative being applied to um, the variation of a Christoffel symbol as its argument. So we would have plus two um, plus a Christoffel symbol times variation here minus um, same deal. different um, indices uh, and then I believe we subtract off one more um, to permute through all indices when we take this variation um, so now looking at the Riemann curvature tensor and I'm not gonna write this thing out in full it would take too much time but under this, under a perturbation of the curvature, um, what you'll find is that um, the variation, because remember, you need the curvature tensor before you get to the Ricci tensor, you'll find that this variation is equal to covariant derivative, um, it's actually something kind of nice. So it's actually um, this difference in covariant derivatives applied to the curvature tensor, or excuse me, a variation in the Christoffel symbol. Um, and that kind of makes sense because the Christoffel symbol is this connection that allows us to um, arrive at curvature. Remember, um, you need those extra uh, parallel transport terms to um, figure out curvature. But when you look at the, reach, uh, the Riemann curvature tensor, it's two uh, covariant derivatives um, applied to something minus the opposite order of it. So you know, if you're thinking about on the surface of a sphere, uh, if you parallel transport like this, um, what happens if we perturb our parallel transport that's kind of what the variation of this um, Riemann curvature tensor is telling us about. Um, but with that, um, uh, you contract indices and you get that. Um, uh, so you don't even need to know what the actual variation of the Ricci t um, tensor is. What this implies is that the variation of r mu nu is equal to the 
is equal to a covariant derivative applied to something um, minus another covariant derivative. Um, maybe call it lambda prime applied to something else. You don't even need to know what these are because what's going to happen is now the variation of our Einstein-Hilbert action becomes this constant. times, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's the variation of this. We pulled out this uh, variational operator acting on the three guys that are within here, and we get um, so we had This plus this plus this. And now, um, substituting everything in now, we have um, plus. We said the variation of the inverse metric was, um, uh, Did we say it was variation of the inverse metric G beta sigma, I believe. Yes. Times the curvature tensor. And then we had this final term here, um, the variation of the square root of the de uh, negative determinant of G. That guy was a little tough to get, but it turned out that it's simply um, one half negative uh, square root of negative g, g mu nu, that. So um, for boundary terms, you can integrate this by parts, and what you'll find is that the whole thing goes away. And that should make sense, right? Um, the integral with this integration measure here of um, uh, of a covariant derivative applied to something, this should get canceled out with this. This should just be one. Or, or rather, this should just, the, the integral um, will be canceled off and you'll be left with something that um, is just uh, proportional to something that's outside of the integral. But since we're extremizing the action, boundary terms must go away. Um, so we've already reduced to two objects here. Um, and, and by the way, I'm going to swap my indices here. Um, uh, you can do that just by multiplying through by the metric. Um, that's because I have the variation of um, the inverse metric right here. and. What I have now is factoring out square root of negative g here. Um, we, re we return our integration measure, which you need in order to um, in order to pull out anything to get an equation of motion. Um, but we also have um, this small variation here that we can factor out. So really, what we get is. Um, We have negative r um, mu nu, right? Let me just make sure it's 
factor that out. Um, oh, and I'm forgetting my curvature tensor. It's Ricci tensor right there. Um, this is like the final line here. Um, Oh, and since I multiplied through by, um, since I swapped these indices by multiplying through by a, uh, a metric, um, uh, this has to go up too. So, um, uh, what I had done was. Um, this. So remember, this is the Ricci scalar. We have a one half here, and we factored out this guy and this guy. So we have plus one half g mu nu r. And if you see what that is, we find that the